Romance as a genre is not what I'm trying to talk about in this video, so if you clicked on this thinking I was gonna start bashing on romance in the year 2021, please just leave. Because I can understand what makes romance interesting. As a writer, I love the way romances are structured. The character studies that focus on true desires are compelling, and the reassurance of its required formulaic structure is a relief from open and tragic endings. But what compels people to look for romance in stories where it's not the sole focus? Why the resistance to exploring the extent of a friendship that would be much more compelling in favor of crumbs for something that usually isn't even canon? Now, when it comes to people's obsessions over romantic couples, I'm no stranger. Look no further than the love teams of Filipino media. A harmful yet lucrative publicity stunt, a strategy that dates back to the 1920s, where two actors' alleged romantic relationship is publicized to the point of casting them both in films where their characters fall in love with each other. Call it fake dating IRL. Except sometimes it actually does become real dating. Wait. <laughs> We don't have time to unpack how fake dating as a trope is problematic and that using it as a marketing strategy in real life is bad. Actually, this isn't an essay on ethnocentrism. My mostly Western audience. We'll get to that. You see, like fake dating as a trope, these people have other people to convince that they're in a loving relationship with one another, even though sometimes they aren't. And these fans are dedicated. I'm talking merch with these celebrities' faces, watching screenings of every film they're together in, taking pictures with them. You get the gist. Same shit with actresses who became sex icons, but like, you're not alone in it, I guess. Now, when it comes to fictional romantic fixations, things get a little less unethical. Considering it's not real people fiction, that's certainly a load off your moral backbone. But regardless, the same fanaticism is applied. Merch, fan art, fan fiction, needling and inappropriate questions to the creators, the works. With an added layer, of course, of fans' entitlement to more of the same content. I mean this both with fan fiction and the source material, by the way. It's it's called fan service. And it's not harmful per se, but it does seem to perpetuate a very real social concept observed by one Elizabeth Brake. Professor Brake did a study in 2012 very specifically about marriages and coined a matanormativity. In her book, Minimizing Marriage, she defines it as assumptions that a central, exclusive, amorous relationship is normal for humans, in that it is a universally shared goal, and that such a relationship is normative, in that it should be aimed at in preference to other relationship types. As mentioned in a previous video, since fandom is just a subculture, it still has the behaviors and tendencies of its overcultures. So if society at large in itself is a matanormative, it's not a big stretch to assume that fandoms are as well. That's why you have fakes for ships in tragedies, in content that itself is centered on friendships, and even in content that is largely critical and at times even contemptuous of its own fan base's entitlement in demanding more romantic content from characters that aren't even together. There are some things I want to criticize about this behavior if I haven't been blatant enough. I'll try to cover all my bases, but if I don't get everything, tell me about it in the comments, we can talk about it. We'll be covering some things in these particular fandoms to get a grasp on how prevalent these behaviors really are, along with some, let's say, first-hand sources. Right? Cool. 1. False advertising. I think the first time I ever saw this kind of behavior, I was still very much in anime fandoms, which honestly isn't surprising seeing as a lot of people I knew in anime fandoms weren't very keen on uh, consuming any other kind of media, and were very proudly self-identifying as fetishists. <sighs> so there's this new thing taking over your feed recently. Doesn't have to be anything new necessarily, you're just getting peer reviews about the ships in that show or book series or film, and your mutuals keep telling you that it's a queer romance or centers a queer romance, and that's exciting. You go check it out. Let's say it's Good Omens or hell, maybe even Brimstone Valley Mall. And then you start it and you realize there is nothing even relatively romance centric about any of these properties. Good Omens? all about preventing the apocalypse. Barely a moment spared for character development because half of the plot is centered on the Antichrist while the other half is centered on world building. Brimstone Valley Mall is 
dedicated to a group of demons who are trying to find their missing friend while dealing with how his being missing is tearing them all apart. Did Hornblast really keep them together or was it because they all actually loved each other? And yes, BVM does actually have its own romantic subplot, but it's a romantic subplot. And advertising these shows as romances does more harm than good, really, because it gets people's expectations up. Sure, the fandoms can provide their own content, but that leaves a strain on the story itself, where people start expecting something from it that it's uninterested in providing. Let's provide one more example. So a lot of my friends are really getting into FX's What We Do in the Shadows now. Like everything else I've seen get advertised on my feed, people are showing up and saying that the show itself centers on Nandermo. Which, well, no. If you look back on the history of the show, it started as a mockumentary film, specifically about vampires and what vampires' lives are like in the modern age. It's a kind of balderdash and farcical comedy, but now, as it's a series, showrunners had to provide things to make it serial. This usually involves making the mockumentary a lot more personal and intuitive to a specific character's emotional struggle per episode. It's so kind of like a sitcom. All in all, considering they're the only couple on the show, I expected more content about Nadja and Laszlo. But since A, people hate women, and B, there is no deeper emotional conflict between Nadja and Laszlo, unless you count the most recent season finale, or literally all of what the Jess Gregor stuff was, about back in season two. People are a lot less willing to pay any of that attention. So obviously the only selling point to this show is going to be whatever potential is going on between Nandor and Guillermo. But if you watch it, it actually goes a lot deeper than some non-existent romance subplot. If it was just some mutual pining and star-crossed lovers, people wouldn't be going so gaga about it. There's the world building and the jokes and the character dynamics and so on and so forth. Though these characters serve as narrative windows, the camera is much more interested in the curtains, what makes them them. Because again, this is a mockumentary. But people still sell the entire show as a Nandermo-centric story, which it isn't. And so what it's not about romance? Nuanced relationships don't even have to be good relationships to be compelling. That's how you get cathartic arcs between guardians and charges like in Train to Busan or Mamma Mia. <laughs> between siblings and sibling-like relationships like in Mob Psycho 100 or Shira and the Princesses of Power. And yes, even between mortal enemies. Exhibit A, good omens. Exhibit B, the Prince of Egypt. Exhibit C, literally any comic series about Batman and the Joker. Okay, honestly, all the false advertising won't even be that bad in fandom spaces. A little weird take about a show here and there is fine, but it's made increasingly annoying by ideas of two, palatable queerness. So say you're in an anime fandom, and for lack of any other examples and due to personal experience, say that anime is Boku no Hero Academia. As in most anime fandoms that have a majority male cast, mostly due to the Japanese animation industry's very queer beady and opportunistic uh, merchandise sales, a lot of the fans like to ship the boys with each other. I am not gonna get in- I am not gonna get on the case of shipping teenagers. I'm not. I'm just- we're not getting into it. In the instance that you insist that fellow fans are reaching when it comes to the romance between the boys, maybe they so happen to be looking at each other in the heat of the battle while they're in mortal danger, maybe they just so happen to be hanging out with each other. When you say that they're reaching, it usually ends poorly. Due to your insistence of the friendship between two characters, usually shipped romantically outside of canon, you get accused of being a homophobe, or maybe having internalized homophobia. And what's hilarious to me really is that this behavior only exists for MLM ships. I've talked before about how female characters in sapphic ships get shoved off for very odd reasons, mostly made up for a lot of female socialized people's assumptions that they've gotten over their internalized misogyny and that this behavior they're exhibiting is not something they should be analyzing, yada yada, it's because people hate women. Sapphic ships in general don't get the same verbose defense. If a fan says that, hey, I think Uraraka and Asui are just friends, there's not a lot of okay homophobe. And that's good. Kinda. S sorta. <laughs> 
I'll explore this more in another video, but let's just say that since a lot of discourse like this comes from Western and Western-oriented audiences, I kind of see why it happens all the time. A lot of toxic masculinity is rooted in the West. And these ideas are very much a large part of queer persecution in the West, and that means that it's institutional, systemic, and very much deeply ingrained in Western culture. So, a lot of male characters with screen time and page space are never given the chance to even be thought of as queer unless they've exhibited some very specific behaviors that a lot of cis and heteronormative people think is queer behavior flamboyance, effeminacy, etc. And in turn, due to the lack of variance and representation, a lot of people don't look for works that do cater to those specific needs, but instead turn to the existing work that they're into and write their own content of it. Fan fiction. But as a lot of people tend to forget when it comes to making fan content, Head cannons aren't canon. They're personal and often not even congruent to the canon plot's themes. Unless they are, in which case you either have homophobic creators or you don't see the value between intimate portrayals of male friendships as much as you do with female friendships. In which case, please be advised to look for something that will cater to your needs. Look, your head cannons might be a popular view in the fandom and hell, they might even have a kernel of truth to them if you give the text a really good squinting at. But despite the existence of death of the author, authorial intent is still very important in claiming any kind of representation because you, as a fan, cannot claim a creator's progressiveness for them. And as a lot of people tend to forget, queerness isn't just same-sex attraction. And with that, calling the desire to explore vulnerability and empowerment two characters might get from each other as friends homophobic? is all really, really cold take. In all honesty, this isn't the first or only incident of the same behavior. Fetishists almost always do this when you, say, ship a female character with one of the male leads. Some of them even get upset when you point out the fact that it's canon. So, insisting that a relationship between two men is platonic isn't a problem here. The problem is the fetishization of queer men. <laughs> all in all, I like to call it projecting too much onto a character you like and getting mad when you meet an incongruent view of them. Simply put, a lot of fans have a sense of superiority when it comes to their personal character interpretations, completely disregarding that A, those aren't their characters, and B, their experiences with queerness are not universal. And yes, that includes romantic and non-romantic queerness. I am not about to platform aphobic or anti-polygamous views, but the way fans dismiss non-romantic relationships on top of unfounded allegations of homophobia does usually mean there's an underlying layer of catering very specifically to cis and heteronormative views of queer relationships. Palatable queerness. And what's sad is that sometimes you can't draw the line between internalized bias and outright fetishism, because the latter usually feeds into the former. 3. Chemistry. Ah, my least favorite science, but technically still relevant, something about bonds and whatnot. Now, when I said I understood romance writers and fans, I meant it. I do know what does and doesn't make for a compelling relationship between two characters, and sometimes I can't even deny seeing the chemistry between them and interpret that as a good foundation for a romantic relationship. Or at the very least, what could start as a very compelling exploration between two characters that have never interacted before and understand as a writer what it would take for two strangers to learn to trust and love each other. I am all for character exploration and romances double as studies on structure. It helps writers work smarter, not harder, because it is easier to write a story you already know the conclusion to. All you need to do is figure out what happens between before and after. That's how you get so many fans of a Zero Crow or an Undatomo or, I don't know, Sam Bucky. But all the same, with regards to metanormative ideas, having that chemistry doesn't cancel out the possibility of exploring it platonically. I think people who have fed into a metanormative ideas and beliefs want to forget 
or just neglect to understand how hard it is to make and maintain a friendship. How, like any other relationship, it takes a lot more than mutual trust and compatibility. How falling out with a friend feels just as much, if not more, painful than losing a romantic partner. How years and years of companionship and emotional support and just trust can lead to a more nuanced relationship. And exploring that in fiction without immediately turning to romance can be cathartic, profound, and even inclusive, especially to people on the A-spec. The intensity of any lifelong non-romantic relationship is never simplistic, especially if you're really, really into found family. Conclusion. All in all, the fandom obsession with romance isn't something I scorn. I, it, it's fun to have some mindless fluff from time to time. What's really infuriating to me is when people overemphasize romantic subplots, some not even actually romantic, to the point where they just completely ignore why it was involved in the story itself. In stories that contain love stories, frequently the love story itself is a form of thematic plot device. It serves to symbolize something out of more than one character, just like any other relationship in the story itself. That's one of my biggest nitpicks with fandoms like Pacific Rims too. Because if you watch the film, it's a very poignant piece about trust, recovery, grief, and support about how Mako and Raleigh learn to understand how they cope and how they have to work together. It's a wonderfully written and filmed bond between two diametrically opposed people that didn't end in romance. But when you look at the tags or the content made for this, either they focus on the side characters whose platonic subplot was also used to emphasize Mako and Raleigh's main platonic subplot and make it into a romantic one, or they grab the concept and use it for a different fandom to forward a romantic subplot. You see what's happening there? There's just a tinge of disrespect to it that frustrates me. The people don't understand that drift compatibility is a concept about emotionally synergizing with a person you would never get along with and understanding their point of view. That in the original film, it was applied only to non-romantic relationships. Now, I'd be remiss to say that some of this didn't stem from my time in the Penumbra fandom, mostly out of some frustration with how fans of tunnel vision around Juno and Rev, and specifically just about Juno and Rev. So yeah, Jeanette was kind of right. This is a spiritual sequel to my People Hate Women video. <laughs> I talked a lot about fetishization of MLM ships more in this, not to hate on people who love those ships, but because of a mix of that fetishization, obsession, and the matter normativity, fans have been discouraged to explore, discuss, and have meaningful conversations about more than just any potential or canonical romantic relationship. There's a shit ton of stuff more interesting than romantic subplot. World building, non-romantic character dynamics, race, culture, disabledness, and yes, even just theorizing what happens next in the next installment of your favorite piece of media. Love is a grand idea, and it shouldn't start or end with a kiss. Special thanks to Gab for helping me with this essay idea. You can go follow her on Instagram, Twitter, or Tumblr at Navy Blue Art. She has really good art. You guys should, should follow her. Okay. Shout out again to Jeanette for being a real one. Thank you to my Patreon supporters for making this possible. And thank you for making it this far. Comments and likes are very much appreciated. Subscribe and share if you like the vibe. If you want to see previews of essay draft, announcements, extra content, help me pick out what comes out next. Be sure to support me on Patreon. If you want to give your support in a different way, I also have a Kofi account where you can also request me to draw you something. Anyway, stay safe. Ingat tayong lahat. Bye!